Ladies and gentlemen, what's going on? Today we're going to talk about the richest man in the world. And no, I'm not referring to Elon Musk and I'm not referring to Jeffrey Bezos. I'm talking about our buddy Warren Buffett, the greatest capital allocator of all time. Now, you're going to say, John, but Warren Buffett, he's like number seven on the list. He only has $130 billion. Jeffrey and Elon have like $200 billion each. That's true. So technically, not the richest. But if you actually think about it, who has the biggest bank account? When it actually comes down to it, who's got the biggest war chest of real cash sitting in the bank, literally sitting there in the checking account, ready to be fired away at whatever he wants? And that is Warren Buffett. So today is Berkshire Hathaway's earnings. And I just want to go over some of the financials quickly with you guys. And, you know, just we can just admire and sit in awe at the, the, the awesomeness of Mr. Warren Buffett and his investing and capital allocation abilities. So going back to my main point, he's the richest man in the world. You know why? Because he now has a hundred and eighty-eight billion dollar cash position. That's a hundred and eighty-eight billion dollars that he can deploy at whatever he wants. He has thirty-one percent of the voting power. When you look at Meta, you look at Mark Zuckerberg, you say, How much money does he have? He has about sixty billion on their balance sheet of cash ready to go over at, at Meta. So technically, he has about 60 billion that he could play with. Uh, Tesla, Elon Musk, he has like 25 billion, 30 billion. So nobody's in the realm of Mr. Warren Buffett. And Jeff Bezos, he's checked out from, uh, so I'm not gonna count that. If Jeff Bezos wants money, he has to sell his stock. He's not really in control of Amazon in the way that Warren Buffett is in control of Berkshire. So Berkshire's market cap was a lot less than Amazon, but the war chest, the cash position that Warren Buffett has is just crazy, $188 billion. He's ready to go, fired away, whatever investments he wants. And obviously we're not gonna count the Saudis because they're over there. You get too big is one of the Saudis and you get clapped, it's the way it works. So. That doesn't really count. If one of the Saudis had a $188 billion war chest, trust me, they would not have that $188 billion war chest. But anyways, let's look a little more into the Berkshire stuff. I was looking at some cool things. So here I pulled up 10 largest holdings in the Warren Buffett portfolio. So this is published on March 19th, so it's not as up to date as whatever's going on today necessarily with the meeting and the positions that are being updated and disclosed. But it's interesting because at one point, Apple made up 50% of the public companies, the positions that Berkshire Hathaway owns. So Berkshire Hathaway is divided into two parts. That's how I look at it. You have the businesses that Berkshire owns outright fully. They're not publicly traded. And then you have uh, the publicly traded companies that Berkshire Hathaway has a, a massive position in and they collect a dividend, they're beneficiaries of the buybacks, things like that. And of the public companies, 50% at one time was strictly Apple. So when people come to me and they say, oh, you know, diversification, da da da, that's how you get rich, da da da. Say, well, look at the richest people in the world. None of them diversify, none of them, all right? Mark Zuckerberg, his entire net worth is in one company, Meta. Jeff Bezos, his entire company, his net worth is in Amazon. Elon Musk, his entire net worth is in SpaceX and Tesla. Warren Buffett, his entire net worth is in Berkshire. And then you're like, well, Berkshire is diversified. And you're like, Berkshire is not even diversified. 50. So if you look at like an ETF, let's say, the largest position you'll see in, in some aggressive ETFs might be like, 15%, 20%. I believe that the SEC doesn't even really want ETFs to have more than like 25% in any one single holding. You can't go more than like three days with over 
in one holding. This is why someone like ARK Invest, maybe they wanna have 50% in Tesla, but they can't. But then the beautiful thing about Berkshire Hathaway and that entity is structured compared to an ETF is that it's a holding company. It's its own company that's publicly traded so they can do whatever they want with their own money. And what do they choose to do is at one point have 50% of their public publicly traded biz money. And what do they choose to do is at one point have 50% of their public publicly traded businesses that they own was in just Apple. That shows you that diversification isn't the way to go. You need to have concentration in order to outperform. Okay, you want to beat the market, you need to be concentrated in positions that you truly believe. But that's a side point. Let's look at the top largest holdings and I'm going to give my little two cents on each one. So Apple, of course, at the top, $2.7 trillion market cap. Bank of America, $280 billion market cap. Uh, Amex, $160 billion, up 17% year to date, pretty good. Uh, so first, these top three, I, I love these positions. Now, I kind of agree with Warren Buffett on trimming Apple because like I said in my last video about Apple being really highly valued, it's, it's pretty high valuation if you really consider the growth. Now, there's a reason for that high valuation. It's because they have buybacks. They buy back so much of the stock that every year you're going to receive more of whatever money Apple makes if you don't sell your position because your piece of the pie is growing because of the buybacks that they're doing. So Apple on their earnings just announced a $110 billion buyback. To me, that's the main reason why the stock popped on the earnings because in my last video, I was saying there's a very high probability that the stock goes down, but that probability didn't play out, which is fine. And so, because of the buybacks, it's hard for Apple stock to go down. But anyways, the point still being that there's very little growth. There's no growth actually in the last year for Apple. Now in the future, Apple's probably gonna grow. Inflation is gonna make Apple's prices go up, so they're gonna grow. They're gonna come out with the new iPhones and maybe there's some AI component to it and that'll spark some more growth. But the point is that when you compare Apple to like a Microsoft or Apple to like a Nvidia or Apple to Tesla even, these other companies are growing and they have a lot more growth in the bag to come. Whereas Apple's very dominant in its market. And in fact, it's showing a lack of ability to compete in newer markets. When they shut down the car division, that was a massive blow just to the whole thesis of Apple and their ability to enter new markets. Bank of America is great. I agree with that position. American Express, extremely great company. If they can, I would expand more on American Express. They're gangbusters. They're a great business. They're growing. I would trim the Apple and add to the Amex as much as you can without making the stock shoot up. Because the thing is, once you're so big, like, like Warren Buffett, you have this problem of wanting to add to a position, but you want to do it in a manner that's not going to make the stock explode. Because as you're buying, there's less and less sellers that are willing to sell for that price. So if I'm buying 10 billion of a stock here and the company's only worth 160 billion, you're buying a huge chunk of that company. So there's only so many sellers there to absorb your 10 billion in purchasing. And eventually you're gonna end up be buying the company at 200 billion, 220 billion market cap. And that's not as good as valuation proposition as when you initially were trying to get in the position at the 160 billion. So it's hard to deploy the capital once you're someone like Warren Buffett. This position, I really don't agree with. Coca-Cola. I think Coca-Cola's tapped. They're kind of like Apple, but it's almost worse. Obviously, there's, they're going to grow because of inflation, but I would not be adding to this position. I don't believe he's added to this position in a long time. I think it just sits there. And if you go with my motto of never sell, all right, kind of makes sense. You got Coca-Cola. You did really good on it. You're collecting crazy fat dividends. Those dividends, when you look at the ROI from your original investment are ridiculous. So it doesn't make sense to sell it. You just hold it, it just sits there. As long as the company's not shrinking, as long as the company's just going sideways and paying bigger and bigger dividends, 
use those dividends in other ways. Chevron Energy has just been performing extremely well recently, and it's always going to perform well. Obviously, we're moving more to more renewable energy, but that's going to take 100 years. So Chevron, Oxy, right here, back to back, these positions, they're going to keep growing, and their dividends are just cranking money into that $188 billion war chest that we were talking about. So the common factor with all these companies is that they all pay dividends. That's what Warren Buffett loves. He wants to receive money, a dividend growth as well. Kraft Heinz don't like this business. It's just a bad business. And I don't think they're managing their capital well. I haven't looked at their financials in a long time, but they're down 8% year to date. So don't like this business whatsoever. I put it in the Coca-Cola bag. Moody's, 70 billion. And he's spoken on Kraft in the past saying that it was a mistake and da da da. So I wonder how big the position is that they have and where they are. Are they up? Are they down on the position? Pretty sure they pay a fat dividend. But there's so many other great businesses to own. So it's like, why own food? I mean, like, food makes sense, but why not buy Amazon? Especially when you look at Amazon's growth. But that's not Warren Buffett's forte. I get it. Now let's keep moving. Moody's, great business, 70 billion mark cap. They haven't moved year to date, but they're a great business. A growth, they're a growth dividend stock, which is nice. Mitsubishi, 95 billion, up 50% year to date. Tokyo, the Nikkei has been popping. Industrials, makes sense. I understand the position. Industrials, bullish. Mitsu, again, Japan, up 25%. Crazy. So these are the top 10 positions that Warren Buffett has in Berkshire Hathaway. Their uh, meeting is today. So let's look a little bit into the uh, earnings and some of that information that we have here in this article. Um, Berkshire Hathaway operating earnings soar 39% as Buffett's cash hoard swells to $188 billion. The Warren Buffett-led conglomerate posted an operating profit which encompasses earnings from the company's wholly owned businesses that surged 39% to $11.2 billion from the year earlier period. They're up 39% from the same quarter last year. That's really crazy. And then they say right here that the majority of that came and happened because they had a 185% increase from the insurance underwriting business. So they went from making $911 million, right, same time last year, to this time they're making 2.6 billion in earnings just from the insurance business. That's crazy. But now you gotta remember, I think it was like a year ago, how they were talking about how much money they were losing because the costs of everything was going up. So when they're doing repairs for insurance, car, whatever, the costs are going up, but they hadn't charged those high premiums. So I think this is kind of the catch up when it comes to the inflation aspect of insurance they're upping the rates on everybody and now they're reaping the benefits of that so it's like one year they got clapped because they had written the premiums at a lower inflation before we printed all that money and the cost of everything went up so when everyone's cars were breaking down housing and people are putting in claims they're paying higher prices for doing these repairs and when they're getting quotes but they weren't receiving those premiums to match that but now they've had time to do the catch up. Berkshire reported Saturday a huge year over year increase in the operating earnings in the first quarter, while its cash holdings bubbled to record levels. So, this is really why I wanted to make the video because I just saw this 188 billion number and I was like, dude, that's crazy. And then I thought about it, I was like, there's not a person on the planet that has a bigger amount of cash that they can single handedly, if he said tomorrow we're gonna buy $10 billion of American Express, he could do it. If he said tomorrow we're going to buy $10 billion in Tesla, he could do it. And we're going to buy $10 billion in Amazon, he could do it. So he really is truly the richest person on the planet. RIP, the GOAT, Charlie Munger. This is going to be the first annual meeting without him. So that should be interesting just seeing the dynamics of him sitting up there without his side GOAT. Charlie Munger, RP. But that's what I got for you guys. I just thought this stuff was kind of interesting. 
to share with you guys. Again, this goes back to the idea of never sell. Never sell a good stock. Never sell a great company. Never sell your winners. If you're in a race, racing cars, and you're winning, and you're betting on the winning race car, you're not gonna switch up to go bet on the second race car because, oh, I can bet on the second guy because the, the betting odds are better. Yeah, the betting odds are better because he's probably not gonna win. Stick with the winners. Stick with the winners. Hold your winners. Like I always say, it's not the investments that you make that lose money that you're gonna remember about years later in your life. It's the investments you make that you made money but sold early to watch 10x, 100x, 1000x for years to come. That's the one that's gonna hurt you. It's always the story of, yeah, man, I had Apple stock back in da da da, and you know, if I had held on to my Apple stock, I would have $800,000 from that, but instead I sold it for $8,000 gain. Okay, those are the investments that are gonna haunt you. And this is something that Warren Buffett has understood intuitively, which is if you have a great business, it doesn't matter if it's down or sideways or up 100%, 50%, 20% in a year. What matters is where's this business gonna be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now. That's what makes you the GOAT investor. So stay healthy, stay wealthy, and stay tuned for the next one. Peace. Also make sure you like and subscribe. Peace.